Just learn Next 13 and now have to learn 14? Please don't be so harsh. I just learned Next 13 and now continue to learn Next 14, changing too much in too short of a time. Are we already at Next 14? I just finally migrated all my apps to 13. <sighs> this is supposed to be my week off. I have been doing so much, but I feel like I have to talk about this. So without further ado, let's talk about the truth about Next 14. I was at NextConf and I will disclose, Vercel does sponsor the channel. They're not sponsoring this video. They have no idea it's being made. That all said, I think it's important to set the record straight with Next 14 because it's actually a really boring release. I know coming from me, there are crazy things that I probably think are boring, but Next 14 did almost nothing. There are no API changes, no significant things you should have to alter in your app at all. It's mostly a stability pass on some core features and attempts to make Next even faster for developers. Nothing here should immediately change the way you build apps, and there's really nothing new to learn. What exactly does Next 14 change, and what's all this drama coming from? This is the official Next 14 blog post announcement. If you watch the keynote, it actually started slightly different with a big slide saying very clearly, no new APIs. And I want to emphasize that there is nothing new in Next 14 that you will have to code differently for or around. The point of Next 14 is to stabilize and push forward a lot of these things. Just because there's a major version bump doesn't necessarily mean everything is changing underneath you. And while many other authors might like to push that, this is mostly the Next team following major releases of Node. There's a new Next version for every new Node version. It's that simple. Anyways, what did they actually change? Four core things. Well, only three of them are even part of Next. First is Turbo Pack, which is now more stable. It's still not quite there yet. It's passing a lot of their internal tests, but not 100% yet. And I'll be honest, I still get to get Turbo Pack running on any of my real projects. So hopeful, excited for the much faster DX, but we're not there just yet. Just a huge step forward. Server Actions being stable is much more interesting though, because Server Actions have been controversial to say the least. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but I just wanna go through these one at a time. And my favorite part, partial pre-rendering. I've been asking for for this for a long time. And we're gonna have to make some diagrams to explain just why it is so powerful. Outside of Next directly, there is Next.js Learn, which is a new education resource for people looking to learn Next.js, discover these new patterns, and maybe even onboard their teams at their companies. Really cool that they're focused on education materials as much as they are. Hype to see this being a focus for the Next team. But again, that's making Next easier. It's not a change to Next itself. So any outrage about that is particularly confusing to me. So let's go through these one at a time. The Next.js compiler, turbocharged. From my understanding, the TurboPack teams had a shift in focus away from reinventing the entirety of Webpack and towards addressing the slowest parts of Next.js in order to make them compile faster. With the app router requiring a decent bit more compilation on both the back end and the front end, so to speak, sides, it is nice to see these changes happening. And from the experimental projects I've played with it in, it is way faster. Again, sadly, I've not gotten it running on any of my real projects. A big part of that is that the Clerk SDK does not seem to play nice with Turbo at the moment. I do hope to see that addressed in the future though. So again, not a priority just yet. Cool to see the progress, but I can't use this. Nothing's changing as far as I'm concerned here. The next section is forms and mutations, where they start by pointing out that Next 9 introduced API routes. I've been using them since around 10. Really powerful way to introduce an API right next to your Next.js code inside of the same project. You no longer need to spin up Express just to have an API endpoint. Really cool stuff. But in the end, you're writing effectively the exact same code as you would have if you had an Express project. You're just co-locating the files, kind of. But there's no strong relationship between them and no clarity as to how one affects the other, unless you write a bunch of custom types, and even then those aren't reliable. The Next team's been working really hard to adjust this for a while, and we have outside of it too. I mean, look, TRPC is one of the best ways to take advantage of those API routes and not have to worry about type safety and consistency between the endpoints. But we're not here to talk about TRPC. We're here to talk about the new thing that Next didn't introduce here, but stabilized here which is server actions. Server actions allow you to write that server code that does whatever you want the server to do inside of code that looks like client code. I wanna be very clear about this here. This is not client code. You can't write a server action inside of a file that goes to the user. If this JavaScript is accessible to the user, this won't compile. If you write a use server function in a use client file, it will not work. It will not compile. It will yell at you for it. The thing that's really hard to get your mind around here is that this code here, this is entirely server code. It happens to create a form that gets sent to the user HTML, but any JavaScript you write in this file does not go to the user. And when the user clicks the button to submit, it's actually posting to this endpoint using traditional web standards, not an AJAX request. This is the thing I think is tripping people up the most because they're looking at this and seeing something that they associate with servers, like a database call, right next to something they associate with clients, like 
JSX. But JSX does not necessarily mean client-side code anymore. It means something the user might see, but it does not mean the JavaScript itself is going to the user, which is a really powerful part of this pattern. And it's a big part of why I like it so much. They're not trying to brute force something like TRPC inside of your client components. They're trying to make it easier to keep things on the server when they should be and pull in the client when you should as well. I really like this pattern. I'm really excited by what the next team is doing here. And I'm a little sad about how people have responded, but I do think we'll make more progress going forward. And if you're here to complain about the SQL string template literals thing, please learn what tag functions are because we've had this solved in JavaScript for a long time. Just because you see a string and you see somebody inserting values into some SQL, that does not mean we are introducing SQL injection problems. You can watch Josh Tried Code's video if you want to see more about that, but I'm, I'm tired of talking about it. Y'all need to learn how JavaScript works before you make these assumptions. Once again, this is not a new thing that they just introduced. This has been in Next 13 for a while. I had a package using this stuff over a year ago. What changed is that it's now stable. And honestly, the only thing that that changes is that I have a config value I can delete from the next config. And also I can use server actions with Turbo because previously Turbo didn't work if you had any experimental flags. Ah, yeah, this is a release for me, not for a lot of y'all. This is changing some of the fun experimental stuff to make it a little more accessible, but there's nothing really new in this release, except for, this is my favorite part, Partial pre-rendering. I'm sure that they have a lot of really nice things to say here all about it, but I'm gonna go straight into my diagrams because this is a thing I've wanted and have been asking for for a long time. For this, we're just going through the basic single page app model if you use something like Create React App. Step one, it's gonna be the same for all of these. The request is made. Step two, with again, the single page app model, HTML file with script tag sent to client. What I mean here is when you create something with like Vite or Create React App, you get an HTML file as your starting point. And that starting point has a script tag in it that loads your JavaScript where most of the page content comes from. This HTML file is almost entirely static and very, very rarely has the content you actually want on the page. So if you have a dashboard or some tweets that load in or whatever, all of the content that is rendered by React gets rendered after this HTML loads and then the JavaScript loads and then the JavaScript starts to render. So let's encode all of those steps. Step three, JS file loaded. Step four, JS runs, realizes it needs more data. And here's where we start to see how many steps exist in this pipe. So JS runs, realizes it needs more data. Step five, JS fetches data, renders content or real. And roughly around this point, you'll finally have your correct content. So the important things to recognize here are that after the request is made and you get that HTML file, you probably have a skeleton state. So you'll see now with JavaScript disabled, I load the Twitch homepage. This is all we get. Nothing else is going to happen because the entire page's contents actually come from JavaScript. So without that JavaScript there and running, the page never has content. However, we get this first response with this cached HTML page almost instantaneously because it's a static HTML file being served from a CDN. Really cool. As for the rest, that tends to take a bit longer because the JavaScript has to run and then fetch additional data and then load the content. But in that time in between, things get really interesting. This is when we get to loading spinner hell. We've all seen this on some sites where it starts with one big loading spinner or a skeleton, and then suddenly the whole page is loading spinners with them all over the place, appearing, disappearing, etc. That's because all of the components that need data are getting the data they need, often waterfalling and going back and forth dozens of times before the correct data has actually made its way to the client. And in that window, you have a ton of loading spinners all over the place. But once all of this is complete, however long that takes, you have the correct page content we have these three different states you get. And in this time above here, there is one last state that's important to know about, which is what I call the boring white page. This is that blank loading page that you'll see in your browser as the, you're waiting for the server to make its first response. If you don't have your HTML cached on a CDN of some form, that piece is going to take a while. It's going to be very slow. You're going to be in this boring white page for a bit. But if you have CDN cached HTML, you get it instantly. And then what this ends up feeling like is the site is much faster, even if it's not, because every single page has a loading state that you have some control of. That's an important detail. So remember that as we go forward. So this was the SPA way. Again, everything I want to cover has been covered a little little bit in my SSR video, but I'm going to go over it really quickly. If you feel like you need more details, then I'll make sure the SSR video is linked in the description. We're going to do the OG SSR way. So think of this with things like Remix, Next Page Router. 
So the SSR way has one very important difference here. We don't go straight to the HTML file. The server processes request generates initial HTML response. And I should just delete all of these because they're no longer accurate. The important thing to realize here is that because the server is taking the request and running that JavaScript to get that first page correct, we end up pushing back when you get the skeleton state really far. So the skeleton state ends up happening like here because it takes a while for the server to finish processing that request because it can't just send a cached HTML response. It doesn't have it. It's generating the correct HTML on every request. Because of that, when you load a next app with the traditional patterns with SSR or even a remix app, you're going to see those blank white pages significantly longer. The solution for this is to either move your compute to things like Edge so that you can get that response faster or to cache an HTML response and then fill the rest in later. But then you're getting almost none of the benefits of the SSR. This puts developers in a really weird spot. And it's also why we've introduced patterns like ISR, which stands for incremental static revalidation, which is a really important pattern because it lets you statically generate the page one time when a user requests it and then serve that cached page going forward. But some user is still going to have to eat this window. I call this cold start hell because this is a really big problem if you're using things like Lambda or services like Vercel that use Node, because this window takes so long to resolve that your websites end up feeling much worse. Even if you do every everything right from that point forward, you'll end up with what is really cool, where you'll have the correct content as soon as the page loads, which is dope. Or if you're streaming in additional responses, you might have a loading state or two, but you're still eating this cold start and there's still a much longer window between when the user goes to the URL and when they see something that you have control of. And this is the difference I really want to highlight here because this is where pre-rendering gets very interesting. So the RSC way. So the server processes and it starts generating HTML, but what it will more often than not do is if you're using suspense correctly, it can immediately send back a skeleton. I'll say skeleton state. And then step three would be server streams rest of content when done creating it. So if you have one widget on your application that is fetching data from your table, and that takes a while, you can wrap that in a suspense. And now once that's done loading, you'll get that response streamed in, updating in line, and you don't have to worry about the user taking too long to get that initial response. However, in order for this pattern to work, we have to have the server process the request. And this is the really big point I want to emphasize. If the server has to process the request, you're going to take longer to get that skeleton state. It's going to take longer for the user to see anything and they're going to be hanging on that boring white page significantly longer. And this makes the perceived performance of your websites significantly worse. So much so that I actually moved to Edge so I could reduce this as much as possible and get you that skeleton state faster. And if you're thinking about this in terms of the request lifecycle, it's really interesting. So here are two rectangles meant to represent the state that your app is in. On the left side is when the request is made, and on the right side is when the content is fully correct. The red is when you're in that white loading page of Doom, where it's just showing you the white skeleton. The blue is when you actually have control of some of the content the user is seeing, when you have an actual contentful skeleton page of some form. So obviously, our goal is to make both of these rectangles as small as possible. But more importantly, is to get this blue rectangle as far to the left as possible so we can give the user a good state. Historically, all of the changes that Next has been making and React as a whole have been making have been focused on reducing the size of this blue rectangle because previously this blue rectangle had like 15 different steps in it. But the piece that people are missing is that this right rectangle got larger. With the old model, you would make a request, you would get that cached HTML response almost immediately, and then the client would have to do a bunch of work in order to fill the page with the right stuff. And I like that the new model went so out of its way to make the blue rectangle smaller. But if we look at like the actual numbers, what we're going to see is something like this, where that first response takes a good bit longer to get to the user, but the amount of time for that response to be correct is much shorter. And even though this means the user is getting content much faster overall, it often feels slower because those white loading pages just feel terrible. And I've ended up doing a lot of crazy things in order to make this red rectangle shorter myself. And the reason that this has to exist is because the response that happens here between these two things, which is that first byte the server sends to the user, if that's not coming from a CDN, is going to take much longer inherently. Ideally, the HTML the user gets as the initial response to their initial request is cached in a CDN. And this is why partial pre-rendering is so interesting. If we take this model and we think about it in terms of the actual bytes that are being sent to the user, where we have the request is being made here, we have the first response the server sends. So this is first response. And then we have at the end here, the final response. And this final response is streamed in. What if we could take this first response and just move it to the side here? That's what pre-rendering is. We are 
effectively taking the first response that your server sends and we are scooting it over so that the rest can come in later. Now, I want to be clear here, the server still has to spin up. So this isn't going to actually be any meaningfully faster. We've effectively done this. We have taken the behavior of the old model where you get a response immediately and we have gotten you that response dynamically generated instantly from a cache. So we're taking the first response the server sends to one of these requests, we're putting it in the CDN and then you stream in everything else after. So you need to make sure that personalized things like stuff that exists in a user specific page, like their recommendations or their profile picture, that those all exist under a suspense boundary. But as long as they do, and all the things above your suspense components are not unique to specific users or specific request behaviors, you can now cache that and get a response immediately. That is huge. This is kind of a best of both worlds. And honestly, it makes me much more hesitant to use Edge because I've historically relied on Edge versus Lambda just to reduce the cold starts. If I was to go back to the way this diagram was a second ago, let's just start making my diagrams before I make my videos. It'll make my life much easier. So again, that first response was coming after the server spun up. And if I was to draw yet another rectangle in here, we'll call this the cold start window. So this is the time that your server is spinning up in order to send that first response. We've effectively let you take this first response and move it to before that. We're not getting rid of this compute. We're not getting rid of the effort that the server has to do in order to start sending responses. We're just taking what it was going to initially send and moving that earlier in the request lifecycle. So this isn't going to make things actually faster. It's just going to make them feel significantly faster, which honestly is much better because we're going to go to a page and we're going to see something instantly. So for blogs, for docs, for all the types of things where the majority of the content doesn't change per user, things will feel comically fast. And honestly, hacking this behavior into ping was a huge part of why people think ping is a super fast site to this day, because ping's actual requests aren't super fast. They often take three plus seconds due to the cold starts that we're eating on the service. But because every page is statically cached by hand, the result is a service that feels nearly instantaneous. And as long as we can move this first response accurately to be way quicker because it's on a CDN, we're going to have a much better time browsing applications using these patterns. So again, this is why I'm so excited. CDN caching is a great tool and we should be able to use it trivially with these changes we finally can. From what I've heard, it's not a super stable change just yet, but I'm sure that will smooth out quickly. It works in Next, but they're still getting the details just right on Vercel itself. So once it's all working, I'll be sure to do some demos and show off just how performant all these new solutions are. I'm excited about this new feature, but it's not even something you turn on. It's just a default behavior with suspense that should have been there day one. And I'm really excited to have it, but it's also kind of boring. What do you think, though? Are you excited for Next 14? Are you trying to move your apps over? What about Turbo Pack? Are you having any luck building with that just yet? If you want to learn more about why I like this new model so much, I'll pin a video all about it there. And if you don't want to see that or you've already watched it, there's a video below it that YouTube seems to think you're going to like. Appreciate y'all a ton. Sorry for the delay getting this one out, but I've been very, very busy. I'm sure y'all understand. See you guys soon. Peace, nerds.